Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soil podcast. I am your host, Kate Cavanaugh, and I am so excited to bring you today's episode with Scott Carney. If you have a moment, I would love if you stuck with me through this intro. If you're an intro skipper, this is one I kind of want you to hear because I think it's really important to impart a couple of ideas. When I initially found Scott's books, I was really struck by the way he wrote about the world, both his viewpoint and the lens through which he saw the world and was able to communicate that in his books, as well as the topics that he explored and the unique way that he finds the interconnectedness of many different things. This is something I am always looking for on this podcast. What is at the heart of our interconnectedness with everything else? And I think that Scott is often moving towards that untouchable topic. And that was a big part of what drew me towards his work. The other thing I love about Scott is that his ideas are always evolving. His opinions are changing, his viewpoint is changing, and I really appreciate people that don't get caught in the stagnation that it's really easy to get caught in. It's really easy for us as we're being pummeled with information from all sides to sort of hunker down on our opinions and not be open to change. This leads me to another important piece of this, which is Scott and I do not agree about everything. And some topics come up in this podcast that we are rather diametrically opposed on. Now, I think this is a strength and I really wanted to mention that because I think oftentimes we avoid or are afraid to talk to people whose opinions are different from our own and afraid to go through those conversations. And while we don't tease out some of the details of this, we do kind of take a step back to share different lenses. And this is the other part that's important is that Scott and I explore this idea of empathy. And when we can employ empathy and when we can see that another person has been on a journey that has led them to their conclusions, the way that they see the world, I think we have a better chance at finding a basis for connection on what we do see eye to eye on or some some depth and some curiosity on what we don't. I think that this episode is important in more ways that I can describe and it was important to me because Scott's books have been such a boon for me over the years. Now, many of you that listen to this podcast with some frequency will know that I love to go off the beaten path with our guests and sort of just leave things that have been covered in other podcasts in the dust. And so I have linked to a couple of podcasts that Scott has been on in the show notes so that you can really explore some of his incredible work with The Wedge, uh, The Enlightenment Trap, which we talk about in this book, and I am going to put on my list next, The Vortex. I say this towards the end of the episode, but Scott has an incredibly engaging way of narrating his books in audiobook format. So if you are an audiobook listener, I really encourage you to seek out those editions of his books and to really begin to play with this idea. And I'll say I didn't share a lot of personal stuff in this episode, but when I came to Scott's work, I was probably at the height of my crippling anxiety and was about to be at the height of my autoimmune journey. And some of the concepts that Scott lays forth in The Wedge were a big impetus for me realizing that I had autonomy and agency in the way that my brain and my body also perceive and respond to stress. And that alone, that concept alone, to be given a sense of agency and autonomy through this beautiful journalism 
is a great gift. And so I want to thank Scott for that. I didn't say that on this episode. I was a little keyed up and nervous, but I, I do relax in later on down into the episode. But I'm really grateful to have the knowledge that I can put a wedge in between stimulus and my response, whether that's the literal act of it in the wedge where you are putting a a wedge in between that stimulus and response when it comes to cold exposure or heat exposure or physical discomfort. And I think what that has translated into for me is an ability to put more of a wedge also in between intellectual pursuits that I can pause in conversation and consider what someone is saying before I jump in with my closely held opinions. I have an opportunity when I'm online and I see something that I don't agree with to pause and consider the viewpoints and the life experiences that might have led to somebody not having the same view as me. And so this podcast really resonates on all of these different levels, especially because Scott and I don't agree on everything. I really hope that you enjoy this episode and I would love to know how his work impacts you if you decide to dive in and read any of his many incredible books. It More is. anxious it is. Now, yeah. now we're on the record. Do, do you edit this at all or do you sort of just like? Post? I edit it. Yeah, Great. I edit awesome. it. It goes cool. through editing. Great. Um, Cool. Well, this is this is really special to me. I I have this relationship with your work where when I read a book that really makes an impact on me, I often remember exactly what I was doing around that mm-hmm. time. And when The Wedge came into my life, I actually heard you on Melissa Urban's podcast. Mm-hmm. And it was late summer of 2020, which was the first year that my husband and I had moved out to our farm. And I think I was getting to experience firsthand how I was interacting with my environment because for Mm -hmm. the first time I was very uncomfortable. There's something about farming that is often too hot, too cold, too heavy, too hard. And it really illuminated that I had some choice in how I responded to that. Mm -hmm. And it really set off a a sort of chain reaction in that. And I'm just so grateful. And it's, it's great to be here with you. Oh, I love that. I love hearing that the, my books have an impact because being a writer is sort of a lonely process. And um, and the, that it, it's like just the other day, an Olympic swimmer wrote to me and being like, oh my God, your life changed, your, your book changed my life. And I'm like, my God, you're an Olympic swimmer. I cannot believe that you're that, that just little old me jumping around in ice and heat and other, and, you know, psychedelics in the Amazon has an effect on people, but it's, it's, uh, it's really an honor to, um, you know, have an impact. So I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And I think in some ways, actually, as I was digging back through your work, I realized that there was inspiration in reading you for where the name of this podcast comes from, that there was this idea that there is this sort of continuous feedback loop Mm -hmm. between our environment and into our body and up to our mind and back to Mm -hmm. our body through our actions that we take in the environment and this mind, body and soil paradigm. And so I I just, I am, I'm really grateful. Well, I Um, I love that. Yeah. That's, it's funny that the book is sort of like on the surface, it sells itself as like a performance book. Like Mm -hmm. here's how to do extreme things. But the reality is it's a book about consciousness. It's a Mm -hmm. book about where we are in this big thing called our own mind streams and, and how who we think we are is not who we are. Um, Who we are is where we respond to stress, where we respond to the outside world. And that outside world is, is just as important to creating our consciousness as whatever processes are going in the gray matter in our brains. Um, you know, I just did a video about split brain experiments that just came out like a few days ago, which is, you know, even in your brain, there's not just one you, there's many, many yous depending on context and wiring and, and, uh, environmental stimulus. So, uh, yeah, it's a deep and crazy journey that, that we're on. And it all begins with putting yourself in, um, uncomfortable situations. That's how you gain a lens onto who you really are. 
Yes. And I wondered if we actually might start with the ultimate uncomfortable, the ultimate idea of an uncomfortable situation and sort of start at the end, or at least what we perceive as the end, and maybe dive into how fear of death plays mm -hmm. a role in how we respond to our environments. Yeah. I've been exploring death a lot on the podcast and mm -hmm. you have there's actually a lot of death in all of your books. When I was going back through the enlightenment trap and what doesn't kill us and the wedge, there's a lot of that hanging over us, the threat of death that can yeah. make us feel alive. And I pulled a quote from you that death is the greatest teacher because it offers us a stake that defines what kind of life we want to have, which I just love. God, I sound so smart sometimes. Um, uh... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I think all of my books have a every I've written five books and I think everyone has this sort of major undercurrent of death and, and, and intensity. And the thing is, is if we talk about evolution, evolution is, is, is it's, it's survival of the fittest. It is the grist of, of everything is that organisms get born, they reproduce, and then they die. And, and hopefully you die after you reproduce. And that is how we get to the, the, you know, humans from whatever our, the, the, the last common ancestor was, you know, a billion or so years ago. And, um, our entire nervous system, our entire being, uh, every cell in our body is programmed to reply and respond to death. And sometimes it goes towards death. I mean, we have this process called apoptosis in our cellular bodies where you have cells that are like, hey, you're cancerous, you gotta go die. Or we just don't need you anymore, you gotta go die. And the cell's like, okay, but, and does Harry carry right there and kills itself. And that is just the process. And that cell doesn't know anything about what Scott's doing. It's just like, I was given the order to die and I followed that order. And, you know, death is one of these things, which is absolutely crucial to being alive. And, and yet most people in the modern world, um, not in the ancient world, interesting enough, but in the modern world, we are so unbelievably scared of death. We do not approach it. We do not want to think about it because honestly, it doesn't sound so great, right? You know, I, I often write, if life were a song, it ends in a minor key. Uh, you know, it's not like, oh, do, 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 we're doing great. It's like, it's definitely gonna be like, bah, at the end in one way or another. And, um, and there's no, if you just don't ever think about it, then you never, you cannot be ready for it. And you cannot, honestly, you, you live in this, this state throughout your whole life where you don't really realize what you have. You don't really realize how wonderful it is to be alive and what a gift every single moment is. And I had the, both the, um, uh, I, I had the, I want to say benefit. There's a good word here, but like I had the opportunity, but this also sounds weird, but like when I was pretty young, I, uh, faced death very, very closely when a, a, a student of mine died on a meditation retreat in India. And I was responsible for bringing her corpse back to the United States, which meant that for like three days, I was dealing with a, a steadily decaying corpse in a hundred yeah. degree heat. And where I'm trying to bring it back to um, the United States. And that got me very, very familiar with the physicality of death, mm -hmm. the, the inevitability and seeing someone going from a bright, vibrant 21 year old lady into essentially meat. I know you're a butcher, you're, you're much more into, you know, you're, you see this every single day, but this was my entry point to this and to seeing it from a person to meat was, you know, probably it's like the instigating incident for much of my writing um, till today. I, mean, I think in four of my books, I mentioned this one event. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned that the the sort of older cultures have a different relationship to death mm -hmm. than we do in our modern culture. And I think part of this is because we don't have that firsthand experience mm -hmm. of that transition. We often tuck death away, whether it's in hospitals mm -hmm. or hospice. We no longer have wakes. Our, our yeah, funeral right. and um, home, how we care for our dead has changed dramatically over mm -hmm. the last couple of hundred of years. And I think as a butcher and as somebody, you know, my husband and I process and we kill all of our own food, you mm -hmm. get this really, you gain an intimacy with the sense of that body's transition from vibrancy into 
into meat, into a mm -hmm. process of decay. And I, mm -hmm. I think it has actually given me a lot mm -hmm. in experiencing that. I mean, that is one of the deepest practices, what you do. I mean, I've never actually um, been involved in, in, in uh, you know, uh, butchering an animal or, uh, you know, what is slaughter? Is that the word? Slaughtering an animal? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I actually think that that is a very, that is a very deep spiritual experience if you are, are present with it. Um, and, and it can be, it can also just be a mechanical, whatever, bit, you know, it, it can just be, a, it can be a, a heartless uh, endeavor as well. But I think, yeah, that's really interesting. I wouldn't, I, I'd, I'd be really interested in seeing that actually and being part of that. Um, I was going to say, point. we should change yeah. that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's go, let's go, <laughs> let's go, let's go, um, make some meals, uh, if, as you will. I mean, because it is, it's very, it's, it's a, it's a totally natural, um, uh, I was going to say human, but it's not even human. It's like everything eats everything. everything else. You know, I eat plants all the time and, you know, you still, I mean, you still kill the plant when you do it. And sometimes the plants are into this, but like, sometimes they're probably <laughs> not. And, uh, and, uh, but with, you know, obviously with animals uh, and humans and whatnot, it's a much more uh, weighty and uh, emotionally connected uh, event. Yes. And I think by seeing it, you, you maybe lose a little bit of your fear for it and gain a sense of reverence that I think you carry with you into life. I think that, you know, like you were saying, we have this sort of biological impetus to be afraid from death. It makes mm -hmm. our, it makes our heart race and it, mm -hmm. it makes our, our whole bodies change. There's a whole hormonal cascade in the face mm -hmm. of death, but we can sort of liked with the wedge that you were getting, you were getting in the middle of that. And I also like that. Hmm, yeah. I like that you're getting in the middle of that and you're making a choice to, of how mm -hmm. to respond when those biological processes come online. Yeah. I think when I, in, at the end of the wedge, what, what I point out is that, you know, if death is inevitable in which we all know it is, uh, what does that mean for your daily life? And in my opinion, and my particular alchemy of my own brain, I think it, what it does is it, is it uh, obligates us to take risks. It obligates us to push ourselves into boundaries because if you just live in a very narrow range of stimuli of of, of experience, then you're never going to get the most out of your life. And, and, and it, the beauty of death is that we all lost this battle. Like we know that this, this battle of eternal life, if that is our battle is a lost cause. You're not going to do it. It's not going to get, you know, no matter what, no matter how rich you are, no matter poor you are, no matter how successful, how many followers you have on Instagram, it don't matter. You're going to die. And and given that knowledge, it allows you to say, well, look, I guess I can do whatever the hell I want. As long as, you know, you're being responsible with it. Like, I don't want you to go out and jump off a cliff and, and, and hasten your death. But I want you to be like, look, I can go out there and I can ruffle a few feathers. I can burn a few bridges because at the end of the day, I'm going to die. And whatever, however I fail today is going to, is going to pale into comparison for what I'm actually facing for mm. the game that we're all in, which is that it's ending guys. I love bringing failure into that and giving, giving yourself the opportunity to fail because it's, there is this inevitability. And I, I actually want to pull into this, kind of teasing out some nuance between the fear of death and avoiding death. And mm -hmm. I know that you recently released a video of Mark Hyman talking about the difference <laughs> between biological and chronological age. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea that has begun to permeate the health and wellness community that we went from and and I thought a lot about this this week, this sort of fine line between wanting to maximize our health span, mm -hmm. wanting to wanting to have bodies that continue going and, and brains that are sharp and then to go on a sudden decline. And I think that has recently gotten continually confused with wanting to live forever, wanting to be young forever. Mm -hmm. And the marketing around this community has... Mm -hmm really leaned into that space. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, 
it's it's absolutely insane. And I and I want to point out that it's not a new tradition. I mean, we, this goes back to the very first writing that we ever had in our species, which is you know narrative writing, which was the Epic of Gilgamesh. The plot of the Gilgamesh is that you know Gilgamesh's buddy died, and he was like, I got to go live forever and find the way to eternal life. And it turns out he wasn't able to do it. Like he he, he doesn't get eternal life. That's the first thing humans ever wrote. Um, and then the, <laughs> and then there was the Egyptians, right? You know, they were like, we can live forever if we just build better pyramids. Didn't work. They still died. Um, and on and on and on is that that, that desire for eternal life might be one of the most human um, hmm. feelings because we all want to, we're all afraid of it. But what we're seeing right now in the most recent iteration is this insanity that our technology well, that death is a medical condition, right? Is that, <laughs> it's is a that, pathology. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, that guy's dead. That's a problem. Um, yeah. and, 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 and a lot of people from Mark Hyman to Dave Asprey to the Methuselah mm -hmm. Foundation to on and on and on, these people who are like, you know, if we just treat the symptoms of death, which is aging, um, we can eventually find the metabolic process to have you, you, reader who's going to buy my product, you can live forever as well. And it is, it's disheartening because it takes away the most important thing that we have, which is the fact that our lives are finite. And if you think about somebody who um, does live forever, they, they, or like, let's say it happened, like you could live forever. This person is going to take no risks in their life, right? Cause they get, you know, they can still get hit by the boulder and the car and the other, uh, and the other mm. thing. And they're going to become a shadow of who, what their potential is in, in and, mm. and they're only fearing the inevitable. And it's not going to happen for everyone either. Like, you know, I, I am a hundred percent certain that that people like Elon Musk and, you know, whoever else are going to find a way to like drastically extend their lives or they're going to die in the process because they do something stupid also possible. <laughs> um, but, but it could happen, right? We could have a thing is like, you know, you're able to, to, you know, tweak this neuron and this thing and this hormone release. And then you put, you, you bait, you sleep in ice, whatever. And I don't know what the hell you do, but you do something. Mm -hmm. And then, and then this person is going to be able to live forever. And that like defies the nature of evolution that defies the nature of everything. And, and the way I think about it is that you all ready live forever, right? You all, yeah. if you are in this world and you are acting in this world, your actions are rippling out into the universe in ways that, you can never truly understand. Every time I'm talking to you right now, Kate, and you are what you're like three miles from me or something like that. You're, you're, you're I you're, am in New York State. Okay, I'm never very mind. You're far way, away from you. You're you're way far away from me. As I talk to you, and as your listeners listen to my voice, my the uh, the sound waves that are transmitting from my mouth to my microphone, and then going to your micro uh, to your audio outputs that are uh, going to your ears. I'm changing your neurons right now. I am in your flesh because you're listening to me and little neurons are changing and I am making a physical imprint in you, whether you like it or not. And you, dear listener, I'm making a physical imprint in you. And should any of you comment on this video and rate and subscribe and give me, give, <laughs> give this podcast lots of uh, love, um, that, that, that will translate back to your consciousness when you see it. And that is a bizarre thing. And, and every action you have has this sort of infinite refraction potential. And, and I, I think that if we were able to say like, look, that the actions that we do matter and those actions are, are actually more important than our individual experience. And that's hard to get your mind around because we don't experience the world like that. But if you were able to get there, you can suddenly realize that, um, that, that the most important thing is to be a good person, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, the most important thing is to, is to deal with your time here on earth in a good way, to be a positive person, to make a positive impact and that your death is inevitable and it's okay. And I think that when we look at these people who are trying to defeat death, one, it's not going to work. Like we, they might extend their life. Let's say someone gets to 200 years, like, okay, that's maybe possible, right? But they're not going to last to the heat death of the universe, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're not going to last to the, the sun exploding. They're not even going to last a thousand years, let's be honest. Um, they're st they still have to reach that one terrible moment, that one minor key. And I bet their minor key is going to be a lot worse than our minor key. Uh, and finally, have you ever read the book, The Sandman? No, I haven't. The, okay. So this, the, the Neil Gaiman's series, 
awesome. I think there's a there's a TV. I mean, show I love now. Neil Gaiman. So there's this there's this thing where he writes about where the, one of the characters is death, the other is dream, um, and mm. and so so in this world there are immortals that have been granted immortality by go- by the gods, and they can still die if they get like a car hits them, but they are immortals. And one of these immortals has lived, I think, like four hundred years or something, and and a car hits him and he dies, and then he goes to death and he says, "Well, death, you know, I guess I'm going to go to the afterlife now, but you know." I did pretty good, right? I lasted 400 years. I did pretty good. And death just looks at at this person and says, you lived exactly the same amount as everyone else. And he was like, what? I lived 400 years. He's like, you lived exactly one human life. And I mm-hmm. find that a really beautiful idea because like how we measure things, we can measure it in okay. time, but that's not the only way to measure effects, right? We can no. measure the fact that we're actually all equal. And I find that way more gratifying as a as a biological entity it's it's really interesting to hear you talk about the ripple effects of our actions and consciousness because i think about this a lot in terms of nutrient cycling when i'm thinking about Mm -hmm. death i think Mm -hmm. about you have at the layer of soil you have these microorganisms right one billion microorganisms in a single teaspoon of soil and they're Mm -hmm. working inside the soil to liberate minerals from rocks Mm -hmm. which are just right stardust compressed through deep time Mm -hmm. and they're liberating them and exchanging them at the plant root for carbon mostly and Mm -hmm. it's going into that plant which is then going to be eaten probably by an animal and those minerals are then becoming a part of our own Mm -hmm. bodies Mm -hmm. which will then die and return back to at least in a a more natural system back to the soil Mm -hmm. and be recycled throughout time and i think in that way like we're all just made up and i've heard you talk about like with michael phillip we're all made up of the same matter Mm -hmm. that is just recycled ad nauseum and i think that Mm -hmm. in that same way i think consciousness is following a a similar enough pattern yeah absolutely and you know just think about our burial traditions how terrible they are in the world right like let's i think about this a lot (laughs) yeah like compost me or whatever like you don't don't Mm -hmm. just like shove Mm -hmm. me full of chemicals to delay that process i mean honestly in the long in the long view it doesn't matter right in the long view if, if it takes me a thousand years to leak out of a coffin and enter the cycle. That's still fine. But um, in the short view, it's ridiculous. It's another mm-hmm. extension of our idiotic view towards death. And 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 you're right, the nutrient cycles move. And, and I don't know what consciousness is from, I mean, I have an idea of what consciousness is, but, I, but like whatever that experience of consciousness probably dissipates with, uh, on death, right? It probably goes away, uh, but I don't know where it goes to. Uh, you know, does it dissolve like you do in sleep? Does it, does it enter, does it, do do you enter into a a heaven where you have a whole bunch of virgins around you? I don't know what happens, but like something happens. And I, and, and, um, and I think that, that this idea of cycling and idea of impact during your life, you know, I am new, I am giving you a, a conscious nutrient right now. And hopefully it's a good one. It could be a bad nutrient. I don't know. You can decide that later, but like the, like we are all sort of engaging in this with both our words uh, as well as our actions, as well as like the subtle things. Like you don't need to, like there was this, you know, obviously you've heard of Nietzsche, right? The idea of eternal recurrence. And he has this idea of the Superman, the Ubermensch, um, which you know, Hitler took in an interesting direction. But um, the, the idea is that you, the more famous you are, the more, the bigger splash you make in the pool of consciousness and those, and those bigger ripples matter more. But I actually think that's, a, a, you know, that's sort of, making a mistake is that it's still just a pool of water that we're coming from, right? You're still just Mm -hmm. that pool of consciousness and we're all in there, all just mixing around. And the idea that your ego had to make that big splash is wrong. uh, Is that you just need to be in the pool. I think it sort of harkens back to what you said about Neil Gaiman. And it's like, it Mm -hmm. made exactly a human sized splash. It was a, it was Mm -hmm. a, it was a human length life and Mm -hmm. it, and it's the same in that way. And I think that that's ego coming in and imagining that we can make greater or lesser splashes when really it's just the same sort of consistent ripple. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think in like, in like the terms of history, like how many people in history actually, 
you even bother to remember, right? Like, you know, okay, Caesar, he was a big guy, right? And then, you know, there, maybe you've heard of Plutarch, maybe you've, you know, like, but you know, it gets, it's, there's not that many, right? And in, in the year 500, who was there? I have no clue, right? And there was probably people who really thought they were super important. Uh, and, you know, maybe you've heard the, the poem Ozymandias, uh, which is by, uh, uh, you know, it, it is the idea of, I can't quote the whole poem because I don't remember every word, but the, the idea is like our archaeologist goes into the, into the Egyptian desert and they see this steel, this, this monument. And it says on the monument, it's all crumbled. It's surrounded by dust. And it says, I am Ozymandias, king of kings. Look, o- look on my works and despair, right? But it's just this like broken down column. Uh, and, <laughs> and we realize that we all get there. <laughs> Yeah, it, which is another effort to to live forever in in a different mm-hmm. sense, right? To to sort of erect a physical monument that will outlive you. And in some ways, I don't think that that is much different in pursuit than some of this wellness, uh, mm-hmm. whatever the snake oil is that's going to live forever. And I know that when I brought this up with you, you said something. Where are all the other ones? This has been happening throughout history. So why why didn't yeah. they stick around? Why didn't these? Yeah specific methods and snake oil. And so I think that there's a lot of different ways in which we look to extend mm-hmm. human life, whether it is snake oil or or trying to live forever, mm-hmm. or it's embalming, or it's mm-hmm. erecting a monument with our name on it about how amazing our exploits were. And it, I think it's important to remember also, because we have this idea that our time period is the pinnacle of history, right? We're like, we are at the most advanced moment that we've ever been in history because we've got science and guys in lab coats who know stuff. Um, and to a degree, we have a more technical sophistication than at any point in human civilization. Uh, on the other hand, every other person in history also thought that they were at the pinnacle of human technological advancement. Like the guys who were building the pyramids, like, look, we can pull brains out of people's noses and we we are at the pinnacle. <laughs> and, and, and everyone has been there, but, and, and we, we have this hubris to believe that, that 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 desire to live forever to whatever it is is somehow going to be answered by our technology and that is a hypothesis that is not a fact that is not a um a, like a reality that is is coming towards us and i will and, you know i've been i think so much about this consciousness stuff so my ideas just sort of bubble out of my head all the time is that we're already in a a miraculous technology that we cannot understand. You know, if you think about the human body or any body, like this is the vehicle of consciousness. We are in Mm -hmm. the vehicle. Like I'm in here, guy, look at my head. Like I'm in here and I am in this thing that was created by a bunch of cells that came together Mm -hmm. starting multicellular life. That's about a billion years ago. Right. And two cells were like, Hey guys, if we work together, um, we're going to do better than that other cell that doesn't. I don't know. They're talking in cell language. I don't know exactly mm-hmm, what it is, mm-hmm. but I think it's probably sensation of some it. sort. And and then one cell says, okay, we made a bigger cell and there was a better cell. And then, you know, you have th- this blossoming of multicellular life uh, a- along many axi- axes. And then at some point you get like a liver, like a liver cell shows up. The liver cell knows nothing about Scott talking to you in a podcast, but it's doing its damn job. And I'm grateful for that liver cell doing that. But there was like a specialization and cooperation where those cells somehow understood that it was more beneficial to work together and specialize in the environment of a liver than it was to go it on their own and create something else. And we are this super organism of stuff, both um, both from our own genetic code, but also through the bacteria genomes. And even like we're all eukaryotes, which means we have a bacteria in all of our cells, in many of our cells that creates energy through ATP. And that's a that's not even us. That's a, it's got a whole other genetic history. It's like a partner and it's in us and we are created and we have the opportunity to talk for all of our cells, the trillions of cells in our body. We are talking for them. And sometimes we do a really good job with that. Not only that, and I, lo- I love when you talk about this in your books, and I, I have a quote from you that I'll bring back up about this, but not only that, but we are not just the trillions of human cells, we are also tens of trillions of cells of other 
organisms, mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. microorganisms and bacteria mm -hmm. that are using our bodies as a vehicle. So we're not just a vehicle for consciousness, but we are a vehicle for other life forms that sometimes I wonder mm -hmm. if we're just a, a tour bus for our bacteria <laughs> to see the world at large. And, totally. And so how, how are they going to get around, right? How are they going to move their, their, their bacteria selves from uh, Denver to New York. Like exactly. they had to hitch a ride and then you were helping them in theory, if you didn't use a toilet, um, uh, you would be helping them spread their bacteria nature to other, to other places. Like, yeah, that it's, it, we're all in it together. We just have different goals. Yes, exactly. I'll, I'll pull this up. Um, this is a quote from you. I like to think of our bodies as jumbles of concentric and constantly interacting bubbles, where each bubble is an umwelt, which I want to talk about, of another subjective experience. The skin senses the environment, the muscles sense the skin and brain, the gut senses food, and bacteria in the gut break that food down and release energy and nutrients that are resources for the body to use. Somehow, all these different parts form the great mass of interactions for a single animal. Humans are super organisms. And oh man, that's a good quote. Yeah, it's such a good <laughs> quote. And I love that you bring up this, this idea, which I, I wasn't familiar with of, I'm going to, and I'm, I'm going to butcher this a little bit of Umwelt. It feels like that's probably how it's pronounced, but we it's don't German, know. who knows? Um, and trying to tease out this idea of what is self and what is other, which I think we just mm -hmm. landed ourselves in, that that our interaction with our environment, that there's this Russian nesting dolls, which is another concept mm -hmm. that you constantly bring in of, mm -hmm. you know, there's our environment and then there's us and then there are various systems inside of our body all the way down to a macrophage or a bacterium mm -hmm. that we are symbiotic with and that we have this relationship with. And mm -hmm. I think a lot about teasing out this idea of self and other, because I mean, like when we went through that little mineral journey I shared with you, our food becomes us, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, Absolutely. there is this moment with our food where it is other, and then it literally becomes self. It informs mm -hmm. our biology. It has this conversation mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so I want to, oh. let's dive into it. No, absolutely. I mean, you're set, you said it very well. So I'm like, what can I add to make that sound smarter? Um, that, that we, we are, like food is, is a fascinating thing. And I'm not a, a nutrition guy um, because I feel like there's a lot of good nutrition guys out there. And I'm like, mm, I just but butcher it. Um, uh, but like Michael but Pollan, you're an right? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. But you're also an environment guy. And I think food is yes. part of our environment. And I right. think that they are one in the same. Yeah, exactly. And that's where I can get into it. Like what I don't do is like, you should eat these nutrients because I don't care. Yep. Um, what I care about is that you um, eat healthy and healthy is both an intellectual exercise as well. It is a, like a, a, a material exercise. Um, and, and which is to say like, you know, you, when we say you should eat healthy, we, we all have a different idea of what healthy means in our mind. Like I'm full keto, I'm carnivore. I am a vegan. I only eat animals that were massaged um, or, or only eat <laughs> plants that were raised by the perfect sun. Like, like we have so many ideas of what healthy is, but you need to embrace one of them. And hopefully a, a one that, that answers also to the material side is like you need certain nutrients in your body. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, eating is a fascinating thing, right? Because we, we take... If you think about the cascade that comes before it, right? I am eating a cow. That cow ate ate plants, right? That that those plants got their nutrients from the carbon cycle and from the sun. So you're eating the sun at the same, mm -hmm. and all of these things. And the history of what what that cow ate, which was then, of course, um, the the plants are are absorbing nutrients from the soil. The soil uh, was formed over thousands or millions of years, all depending on your soil, right? Um, and, and, and we are these churning creatures where, you know, not only is the consciousness important, but whatever the nutrient um, action that our bodies do is also part of the, all of these really, really big cycles here on earth. And I liked how you mm -hmm. said before, like even some minerals, you know, uh, are, are, are essentially stardust. Like the entire planet is, is stardust. We, we, we were, we were forged from the explosions of previous stars, not our star. Actually, our star is a different, uh, is, is, is composed of the same stuff we are, but it's all actually from explosions that happened before that go all the way back to the Big Bang. And when you take a bite of food, you're all part of that cycle. And that thing that you're eating is 
you know, here's, here's my you know, more, you know, we're just go, we're going for it. But that thing that you're eating is actually you because it, it, it you know, when we, <laughs> when we all formed at the very beginning of everything, like if we look at the standard model of physics, there was this idea of a singularity in the big bang, which means everything in the entire universe was com was compressed down to an infinitesimal spot called the singularity, which is smaller than any atom in your body. And it was so small that it was incomprehensible, probably smaller than a Planck length, which is the, the smallest thing that we can measure. And, and then, I don't know, it exploded maybe, right? And it blew up everywhere. And, and you know, we know this idea of a quantum entanglement, which means that like two particles can be entangled. Well, this was even before particles happened. So this fundamental thing of entanglement is, is probably, I mean, likely a state that exists in, 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 in matter. And, and it exploded. And you, when you look up at a star or a cow or a fungus or whatever, at one point, all of that stuff was literally the same thing. And you are still that. And so, yeah, I go big really fast. I'll go from your, your, your mouth full of your spork full of pasta to realize you are the spork. Uh huh. Yeah. And then, and then all the way down, it's like the, did you ever see the powers of 10 movie in high school? I reference this movie all mm. the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you, you saw it where they, they go all the way out and then they go all the way back mm -hmm. in at, at yep. logarithmically. And I think right. pull another, I'm a quote puller. This is just how I, how I understand the world. You, you have this quote, how can we understand the world except through our own eyes? How can we be the universe and be an individual at the same time? And mm -hmm. I think this is akin to Rumi's. You are not a, a drop of the ocean. You are an ocean in a drop. I'm, I'm probably Ooh. butchering that a little bit, but <laughs> it's close yeah, it was in Arabic there. anyway, so you're fine. Uh. <laughs> um, and that experience of, of self and other and you are you are an individual and yet you are continuous with everything yes. in the world yes. and everything is continuous with you mm -hmm. is i mean i think it fundamentally changes our understanding of how we interact mm -hmm. with our environments mm -hmm. and how our environments are interacting with us yeah and it's so hard to to you know it's easy to say those words and it's really hard to feel those words um, because, you know, we all do feel like we're coming from, our, I feel like Scott, you feel like Kate. Um, and, and, and no amount of like, you know, woo, we're all one. Look at the universe beginning. Can I make us feel different from that? But we, but, but we need to, but it's an intellectual exercise to know it. And one way that, you know, I, you, you have lived in Denver, um, you know, we're a big psychedelic state um, at these days. And, the, and one thing that is really interesting about psychedelics, and I'm, and I'm not a regular user, I use them like once every like three years. But like one thing that's really interesting about psychedelics is it gives you, it, it, it sort of like removes the egoness of existence. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at least for those brief windows, you have at least some level of experiencing the world not through your ego eye, mm -hmm. which is which is cool. Like it, like I don't know if it's like reality. Like I know it could be a chemical thing. It could be I'm talking to the plant fungus god. I don't know, but I can I can know that in the experience, I can at least for a brief moment be like, oh, right, my shit doesn't matter nearly as much as I think it does. <laughs> yeah, it's a dissolution of a boundary, and I think mm -hmm. that. I think that we naturally feel, I mean, we do, we have this boundary of our skin. You said that earlier, that, mm -hmm. that sort of makes us human, but beyond that, there's a lot of interaction. And I think one leverage, I think psychedelics are an interesting leverage. And I think that when you talk about umwelt, this word that I can't mm -hmm. pronounce, you talk about it being a good way to employ empathy. And I don't think mm -hmm. I have the quote in front of me, but that when we start to understand umwelt being the way that an organism senses, it's, mm -hmm. it's from its experience. And mm -hmm. so when we kind of think about that and have some empathy for it, I think mm -hmm. that also can remove some of that boundary in mm -hmm. the lens of just normal perception. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and, and umwelt is essentially the, uh, the, perspective of another organism, right? And, and, and any act of me thinking, what's it like to be Kate right now? Right. It, that's, a, that's an act of my um, well, I'm, 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 I'm checking out your um, well from my um, well, so I'm like, Hmm, what's Kate like, or, or, you know, like I have, I have two cats and I continually try to figure out what's going on in their heads. Mm -hmm. And they, meanwhile, 
have figured out my head and know how to manipulate me. So they have also are able to practice this idea of umwelt. But like, you know, if you think about the world from a cat's eye view, there are things that are important to it and there are things that are not, even though things that are important to that, that it does not know are important to it, affect it. So for instance, if I, whether or not I pay my taxes, Scott, the cat doesn't care about it at all. But if I never did, it, it, the cat's environment might get a little problematic as like might the change. house gets seized and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so the cat can't understand what I'm actually dealing with, but I can't really understand what the cat's dealing with because it has whiskers, right? Like it senses the world in a way is like, hmm, my proximity to things is defined by the movement of hair follicles on my, on my, on my nose. Like that's insane. Um, and it sniffs one cat sniffs the other cat's butt to identify who that cat is. I can't really identify that. I just rather look at a cat, but for, to that cat, it's fundamentally important. So there's this whole sensory world that the cat experiences different. And I can, I can look and I can watch that cat and be like, Oh, I sort of get what you're thinking. And the cat does that to me too. And it, the only way that works is through this process of umwelt and also empathy. The idea that I can try to imagine what you must be thinking versus just looking at it from my side and be like, cat, why you be so funny looking like, you know, <laughs> like what, what you doing? You dumb animal. Like it's not dumb. It's like figuring out what's important to it from its own perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have this prevailing question and we talk about this a lot on this podcast that we kind of have this schism with nature, right? Like there, there's a point in human history where we're mm -hmm. a lot more continuous with our environment mm -hmm. and the effects of our environment are a lot more clear to us, whether that's the mm -hmm. cold or the heat and all of those things. But, and you said this, you said this perfectly. Um, you were talking about the early 1900s and you said our technological prowess became so powerful that it broke our fundamental biological links to the world around us. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, that perspective begins to shift, like that boundary right. becomes tighter and it mm -hmm. becomes different. And I think we actually lose some of that empathy because we're not in relationship right with mm -hmm. some of these spaces, some of these environments, or even some mm -hmm. of these, something like cold. Yeah. We begin yeah, to I mean, lose we, that. We have no idea about most relation, about most of our natural relationships because we've outsourced it to technology, right? All of the mm -hmm. uh, abilities that we have today, like a caveman would be like, you talk to people in like a thousand miles away by talking in the air into a little box. That is magic, my friend. I don't know what you're talking about. That is magic. And, and it's, it's not, it's technology, but to, for the caveman to do that, he had to walk to, and you had to walk to him and he had to meet and like, remember we talk. And you know, there was a whole thing that happened that was much more difficult. And, and essentially the process of technology has made, uh, has both greatly expanded our individual abilities, our, um, our own umwelt abilities, at the same time that it has made the exertion to achieve those feats much less. So we've outsourced biology literally mm. to te technology. And our bodies, and there's a, there's a positive spin to this and there's a negative spin to this. The positive spin, uh, let, let's go to the negative spin first. The negative spin is that our biology is not being activated anymore. Remember my, my corp, my corpse, my, my body is the chariot of consciousness. Well, it, it doesn't have to use quite as much energy to do the stuff that it needed to. It doesn't have to heat itself, right? It doesn't have to go outside and be like, Oh, it's cold. I just put on another coat or turn up the heat and I'm a okay. -O. And, and my body is not actually using these evolutionary abilities that were forged since the beginning of um, life on the planet. And, uh, and you know, Homo sapiens is about 300,000 years old. So mm -hmm. we're not actually using something that's, that's actually present. So which means that we are becoming less human. As, we, uh, as you get more technology, you become less human. That's the negative spin. The positive spin is humans have always been going less human. Because if you go back to fire, you know, the, the introduction of fire, that fire digests food and makes it more nutritious and you can yeah. chew it. And when you chew it, you get more nutrients. And then that fire is and a our technology. teeth change. Our, teeth, our teeth, teeth change over time because we're using mm -hmm. technology like fire to break down our food. Do you know Bill Schindler? Mm, no, but I, but I know other guys who write about this Similar process things. that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Story, I mean, Bill story. writes about this. 
Yeah, story of the human body is where I go to, and it uh, um, starts with an L. Leavitz, I think, is his name. Um, but anyway, the idea is that what you're, you're you're pointing to is that our jaws have gotten smaller because of fire, because we don't have to chew as much. And then there's lots of stuff where technology, where our external technology has changed our internal biology, and we've had that process for about a million years um, in humans. So we are part of this change, and as we look forward at what the future holds. Um, I, I see two paths for us. One path is the atomization of humans, which is like, it's all me. And social media makes it all about me, right? I have followers on Instagram or whatever bullshit I think to myself sometimes. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, 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 and, and it becomes all about me, which means um, disintegration of connections between people. And, and so, so not seeing yourself as a cell in that super organism, it's all me. We become cancers of the cell of the world that's out there. Yeah. The other option is that we decide to work together and realize that our, just like that, that, that cancer cell in our body, that gets the signal to go apoptosis to kill itself. Right. Um, because it's like for the greater good, I will do this. And it just does it happily, I guess. I mean, I actually don't speak cell. Um, but the, 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 the idea is that if we are truly externalizing our technology and truly externalizing our abilities, that is an obligation to connect with, with the world. And we may not know through our actions that our work, and I mean both work in terms of jobs, also global economic systems, also all these big things that we have created, if that pulls us together so that we realize that, that at some level that the combined activity of all human action is somehow productive to a greater mission that maybe we can't understand because my cat can't understand my taxes, remember, nor can the macrophages in me understand um, why I'm doing a podcast or anything. But if we can somehow work together so that we become liver cells in the super organism of the earth, um, it could be that, we, that we've come to a better place of consciousness in general, where we realize that we are that water. And we may not realize that we're doing it as we do it, because I don't think the liver cell realized what it was doing to the whole creature. But we might, we might, and I pray that this is true, we might be working on a way toward, already, towards a super consciousness that fills the boundary of the planet um, as one thing. And, and we will never understand the consciousness of what that planet is up to. Alternately, we all go extinct. So, and maybe the planet does too. So, I don't know which way it goes, but but we have two we have two options. Uh, they're fascinating options, and I want to tease out here that I think that they both have to do with connection. I mean, when you're talking about a cancer cell, you're talking about something that happens in isolation. It stops mm -hmm. being able to communicate to the cells around it, and in that isolation, it it goes haywire. And if you're lucky, apoptosis happens. But if mm -hmm. it doesn't, it might begin to multiply. And mm -hmm. I think that conversely, too, to connect, to connect with one another and right. to, to form deeper levels of connection, to get out of our isolation, whether that's just like Kate has followers on Instagram <laughs> or, <laughs> and to be in connection, in relationship, right. perhaps not just with our fellow humans, but also with the environment that rot mm -hmm. our human form is mm -hmm. to really grow something else. And I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine where he talked about technology and corporations, and we don't have to go down this rabbit hole, but becoming this sort of super organism that was mm -hmm. born out of human consciousness. And, and mm -hmm. what I heard you say is that like, there is this other super organism that we can create through a, a more positive spin of connection. Yeah, I mean, we're already creating it. Like, that's the thing. We're already in the process. Yeah. I don't think that the eukaryote cell knew what it was getting into, right? When it started this partnership with a with a bacteria, right? It was like, yeah, let's go, let's go figure this out right now. It, it didn't have the grand plan to eventually be on this podcast, which is the current pinnacle of civilization, as far as I'm concerned, right? The my podcast, the, your personal podcast, yeah. <laughs> my personal podcast, the pinnacle yeah. of human civilization, right? Right. Definitely. But the eukaryote had no idea what was going to go on. It was just like, well, we're going to do this thing and see where this leads. And but it did lead to this podcast, right? One thing after. After another, and this podcast will lead to other things, and uh, and we are working on a human project, and we are looking at the world. We all aware that climate change is a big problem, right? Or and or nuclear war, or whatever disaster we want to think about, and and they are real challenges. 
and we are trying as a species to address it and we may not address it. We may totally fuck this up, <laughs> um, but there's this chance that we do, right? Or there's this chance that by failing, this is usually what happens with biological entities, by failing, you, you create a new homeostatic system. Uh, and it could be a homeostatic system with no humans in it, but mm -hmm. lots of our plastic and our, you know, our corpses <laughs> that have been covered in formaldehyde, like that, and uh -huh. that, and that will create a new environment that then has a chance to do something a little different. But I do think that there's something about consciousness that's really important in this situation, which is that consciousness always offers a choice. And I think that the reason why you and I exist. Um, in the way that we do and the way that we think about things is that because our bodies, you know, has all has all of these little different parts that, are, that have all gotten together and they all like we have this automatic function. I will secrete insulin. Hey, and over here, I'm going to be a neurotransmitter and you have all these parts that somehow added up to you and me. But there's this problem is that once we created this nice cell wall bounded at our skin, we it looked all of those cells looked out at the world through other cells, the eye cells. Right. And looked out at the world. and was like, oh, crap, this place is chaotic and I can't figure it out. What the hell is that big hairy creature with that lot of, lot of the big mane and that tail and those fangs? Oh shit, we need to make a decision about what to do. And it's you run from yeah. the, this is a lion. Um, you either run from the lion. <laughs> I got that. <laughs> or you, you fight the lion or you do something, you, you, you do something in relation to that lion. So consciousness is what it is, is when your automatic bodily structure cannot make an automatic decision. And it had to kick it over to this thin layer of decision-making, which is what consciousness actually is. And mm. most of the decisions in your body are made automatically, or maybe by the individual decisions of individual cells are like, oh, I gotta do this right now. It only has two decisions to make in life, secrete or don't secrete, or like eat that thing, don't eat that thing, but it has that decision to make. You have a wider variety of reasoning to navigate the environment and, 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 and so those choices, which are informed to us by sensations, right? A sensation is seeing something, literally a sense is seeing something or feeling something or an emotional trigger. All of those things are information. And that's why consciousness is there is to make a decision about right now. And the cool thing about consciousness is my consciousness can talk to your consciousness and we can talk and make a decision about what we wanna do together or not together. And mm -hmm. all of human consciousness is operating at the level of like limited liability companies and governments and electric power generation and a food supply, like all, of, and those are all decisions that are being made through things that we see as like fundamentally failing, like fundamentally like yeah. broken in a million ways. And yet they also sort of work, right? It, like right now it's sort of working. Like I, I can go to your shop and I can go buy a chicken for Thanksgiving and everyone here should do that if you live in Denver, cause they're great chickens. And, 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 and at least immediately, we don't know where this is going, but at least immediately it's sort of fucking working guys. And, and we'll see where it leads. This is really interesting because you walked right into my next line of questioning. I have this whole thing about the wedge and choice mm -hmm. and one of the most powerful things about reading that book initially for me was to regain a sense of autonomy and agency over something. Mm -hmm. And that choice, like that is very specific to me. And I'll read, you know, that the wedge is the choice to intercede between stimulus and response. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think though, at this level that there is, there's a bigger wedge, right? There's a bigger Russian nesting doll of the wedge that is the way that we as society as, as a group mm -hmm. or as multiple people make these connections and make a mm -hmm. choice between the stimulus of, of what is happening and the different sure. paths that we could go down and our response, mm -hmm. if we can pause and create that because they're a bigger wedge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I mean, the most recent one, ob the, the most obvious stress is the COVID pandemic, right? Um, but we could also look at a national election or we could look at a war in Ukraine. Doesn't matter, all wedge possibilities here. And, but if we look at the COVID pandemic, they're, they're, the, the super organism response is essentially the public health response to this, right? It's like, we don't know what's really going on, right? Like at the very beginning, no one fucking knew what was going on, right? We're like, ah, okay, there's some bad shit over here. And then we, what we, a, a, a if it was the human body, right? And, and, it, and that was our lens, there would have been the public health figure 
human body, the brain cell for public health and be like, hmm, let's not get sick, right? And as a super organism in the body, we could make a, make a decision. A as a society, we fucked that up pretty bad, right? <laughs> like, I don't care how you came out on vaccines or masks or whatever. Clearly, the way to get through a pandemic wasn't by atomizing, right? Yep. Even if the, the person at the top was an idiot, right? And I don't care what you think about that. But even if the person at the top was an idiot, it was better to follow the idiot than to every one day, let's go, let's, let's, <laughs> let's atomize and go crazy and like definitely not have a plan. Um, and, uh, and the person at the top this last time was, was Fauci, right? And I mean, also Trump and also uh, every other world leader, yeah. like everyone was, of... was freaking involved. There were, there were a lot of different a lot monkeys, of players. a lot of different, yeah. a lot of different great apes. Making it. <laughs> and, and the thing is that we didn't actually have a lot of information at the very beginning. No, we did like, not. Like we didn't, we didn't know how something would survive with a randomized control trial and all this stuff that we knew would take time. So they were like, let's set our rudder on this course. And then everybody with their Instagram followers was like, well, I disagree with the course that you have chosen because I have a different interpretation of the data, which was frankly moronic. Because even a bad decision at the top is better than no decision. And everyone's saying, I want to be a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and we all did that to some degree. Like I'm on the mask vaccine side of things, but that doesn't even really matter. Because I went on the internet, I was like, my mask va vaccine is the right opinion. That was the wrong, wrong the response. The right response was to be like, let's all work together on anything. Like, yes. let's all say <laughs> was was let's say all say vaccines are stupid and we're going to work on our own internal biology or whatever. I don't care if we all did something together, we would have acted like a super organism and our, the outcome would have been better. Um, yes. Literally regardless of the, the, the intellectual paradigm um, that was deployed. Yes. And working on connection instead of division. And I think mm -hmm. that that really, I mean, when you say atomized, it was just divide. And even if you and I mm -hmm. might have different views on it, Mm -hmm. that there mm -hmm. could have been a coming together to, to do this instead of just, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, any, any mutual project would have been, would have been great. And I think it, we've also sort of shown that now that we we can look in hindsight, let, let's say like the world leaders knew everything perfectly and, and one of them had the right answer. Right. And we get to now we look backwards and we're like, actually the data is all fucked up. The vaccines were cool. They were okay. Right. The masks were a pretty decent idea. They were okay. But also these other people were right about other things. And like, and like, actually, you know, we had the, we look at China and they went one direction and America went the other way and both sides got fucked. And, and the, and, and, and the answer there is that there was no answer. We should have worked together. Hmm. I really like that. I really like the coming together on connection because I think that that is, and this, this comes up a lot on the podcast too, is that that is when you're looking at a food system, when you're looking at a pandemic response, we have a lot more in common than we, mm -hmm. we do not in common. And it is our strength is in coming together and seeing that commonality and having a thread of right. empathy, it, whether it's a, a mm -hmm. vegan and regenerative agriculture or a masks and no masks, right? Like there right. is common ground in all of these spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all want to live, right? We all want our world to be nice. We all want security. We all want shelter. We all want like a food supply. Like we have a tremendous amount of con in common. And it's so funny to watch and sad to watch the world descend into absolute chaos because we, we all think that we, our perspective from our Matryoshka doll consciousness is right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like that just assumes that we don't come from anywhere. That assumes that we're not connected. And that is insanity because it's obvious that we're connected. You know, you're more closer to like surviving on your own than I am. Like you can, you can butcher your own meat. I have no idea I'd die in like a week if I, if I didn't have a grocery store. Uh, and, and, and access to a grocery store is, is, is trust in the super organism that mm. we have created. Yes. Right. Yes, it, it, it is trusting in the fact that, that that is there. And those food systems are designed by people who I like, I mean, um, you know, the, the major food companies in the world are freaking crazy and they're messing with our bodies in ways that are just mean. And, um, <laughs> but without them, who would I be? So I, I, I'm sort of like on both sides of this thing. I can, we can make better food systems. On the other hand, I'm really glad we have food systems. Hmm. You said once, and I loved this, that your job as a writer is to show you how in everything is interconnected. 
And Mm -hmm. I think that you embody that in a really powerful way that you are able to show how everything is interconnected and how, how we can have a system that is working, even though it feels Mm -hmm. like it's not working. And I think the food system is Mm -hmm. a good example of this, right? It's, it's working, Mm -hmm. but it feels like it isn't working and to connect it back to all these other spaces and to connect people into all of those Mm -hmm. spaces through the lens of consciousness, through the lens of environment. Yeah. And we can certainly make it better, right? I mean, there's no reason that you can't make a food system that's working into a better food system that works even better. I mean, there's, there's no intellectual problem with that as long as we're all looking at the same problems. And I think the issue again is empathy is that, Although there are bad actors in the world, right? And there, there have been bad actors. We've had the cancer cells, the Hitlers, the Stalins, the, 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 the tobacco executives, you know, the, the oil executives who, you know, we have, we've had bad actors. On the other hand, um, we also have a, a, a much stronger trend of working together. And we need to realize that, um, that in general, people are trying to be good. Right. In general, yes. that the, the action of trying to be good and that we're trying our best to look out in the world and, and, and look at the information that's right in front of us. And I have different information than you have. And I'm going to use that information to try to, like, not be an asshole and, and, and figure things out. And and you know, I, I always come back to Fauci because I think he's a wonderfully controversial figure. Um, and I don't agree with everything he did because he's got like this. He's got a, a, a past that's that's somewhat problematic, but also pretty impressive, like. He's way smarter than I am at public health. Let me just tell you that right now, because he was in it, right? And he had n- no information. Like, based on no information, how do I act? And I don't think I could have come up with a better response in that particular political mm-hmm. environment. I could have come up with a utopian response that Scott Carney was like, well, if the world was made of rainbows, here's how I would have responded. But like, in that moment where you have like riots going on around America, like, what could have he said? What could have he done that everyone would be like, you know, that's a really rational, good idea. And I'm on board. Nothing like absolutely hmm. nothing. Cause we are like vicious zombies who want to tear people, each other apart. Cause we, cause we have more Instagram followers than you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think you said something really salient in there, which is we get hooked on an idea of utopianism that doesn't exist. And that, mm-hmm. that, propels us. And I think that in some ways it's no different from Mark Hyman's decision to be young forever, right? Like that's just Mm -hmm. a kind of utopia. Mm -hmm. I I think it's no different Mm -hmm. than enlightenment, right? Like enlightenment Mm -hmm. is, I think in many ways, a definition of utopia. And we Mm -hmm. as humans feel that there are these utopias when there aren't. It's not, it, it, you never reach that space. And so when Mm -hmm. we get caught up in our own little Instagram follower utopian idea of how something might be Mm -hmm. handled, we feel, well, obviously this is the best option without having the empathy to see a variety of different inputs. Yeah. we're, We're so bad at nuance right now. We're so bad at just seeing like, like we all think we're right. And, and sometimes I think I'm right and I get on my high horse and then I'll, and I'll believe it for like a week. Too. I'll be like, I'm fucking right. And then I'll be like, <laughs> but I wasn't totally right. Was I like, I was like <laughs> sort of right. What I had is I had a point. I had, I had a point and, and, uh, and I'm not immune to this. Cause I speak out of my own little Matryoshka doll and you speak out of your Matryoshka doll and everyone mm-hmm. speaks out of their own Matryoshka doll. And we want there to be easy answers. We want there to be right and wrong. And we're, we're, you know, it's part of this is our education system. Part of this is just like democracy. Part of this is like, um, you know, if we lived in a, you know, if we lived in a Stalinist world, right, we would know what was right, which is the one that doesn't get us killed by the Stalinists. Right. And, and, you know, the thing that doesn't get us sent to the gulag is the thing that's right. I'll tell you what. And that was a rational decision too. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny, I can't believe I'm going in this direction, but I could have gone a different direction. Um, if we think about our bodies, our bodies are fucking fascist, right? Our bodies are like, you sell. I don't like apoptosis and it kills millions of cells every day. If that cell gets out of line, it kills it. Um, that is a, a, a relatively efficient way to govern a body. Could you do that with the world? Probably not. You probably need a different method, but like, like, you Damn, know, that's the, again, 
<laughs> I, <laughs> that's one lens of looking at it or I, 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 or is it effective altruism, right? Like those cells are effective altruists and and feel that this is mm-hmm. this is for the greater good. Like, and and there's there's a lot of. But at the same time, I think, hmm, can we apply this level of human consciousness to that action and 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 find? I don't know. Here's the question. Here's how you do it. Does a killer T cell? So a killer T cell is the thing that instigates apoptosis in the, in the immune system, mm-hmm. right? Does the ki- does the 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 broken cell, the old cell, run away from or run to the killer T cell? I don't know. Actually, I put them under microscopes, look to see what the mm. what when when the killer T cell runs through, do the other cells give it a wide berth, or do they are they like, hey, yeah, check me out? I don't know. You know, it's like the the killer T cell is like, show me your papers, <laughs> and because it is, it's like literally, it's got like. It's got um, cytokines yep. on a, on a, that, that detect things. It's like, show me your papers. And it's like, here are my papers, sir. And it's like, you die. And it, like, it, it does this all day. It does it all day. We have these little murder cells running around us. And it makes our body work well. So it's totally anti-democratic. I don't think this is like, I'm definitely not like a pro-Hitler person, right? But like, <laughs> but it is interesting to think about how the superorganism actually operates and how things come together because there does need to be unity in understanding. I would think that at a human level, because consciousness, we're able to navigate the world through decision-making, it, it, it would be better if, it, and I think we've seen this time and again, that the democratic societies are more productive and fruitful. There, it, it Most likely a democratic process is a good idea, but your body's a fascist. I'm gonna have to think on that one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to really marinate on, on, on that analogy and whether or not that sits for me. But um, I, I, I like the idea of it. Um, well, I think it's a terrible idea. It's just what I see when I look at the body. Well, I like the idea oh, of just a great... like finding a way to explain mm-hmm. the process of the human body in terms that we can mm-hmm. better relate to. How about that? Yeah. I, I would like to know because this is the umwelt question. Like, it, what do what does your what does your immune cell, what does your blood cell, what does your meat cell think about the the killer T cell? That's a it's a it's an yeah, interesting it is a good question. question. And I, uh, and I, but I will say that if you look at macrophages, so that's another immune mm-hmm. cell. That's called the big eater cell. That's like your your frontline defense. Um, actually, it's the second line of defense in your immune system. Uh, the first ones are the white cells that sort of go out and explode. They go out there, ah, here's a bad thing, and it explodes and it kills everything around it. And then you have these these macrophages that come in and sort of eat stuff. And what they do, if you look at them under the microscope as they're active, is they they go around and they touch everything around them. They're like, you, 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 you. And depending on like your hormonal secretions, they get either more active or less active. And 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 they say, oh, you're a bacteria or something, and then it just eats it, and and it looks like it's hunting. Like if you can sort of like get into the umwelt of a macrophage, which admittedly is going to be hard to do, it looks like mm-hmm. it's making decisions as it walks around, or uh, they don't walk, they flagella around um, the, the 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 tissues in your body, and and I think that you know it's not thinking, you know, I'm going to hunt, I'm going to do a strategy, but it is it sort of thinking that I don't yeah. know. It's, it's, uh, th- this is where my, my analogies get very, very difficult because you can't anthropomorphize, no. uh, a, a things because humans see things in totally different perspectives, mm-hmm. but, but they are operating in an environment and it sort of looks mm-hmm. like they're making decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there is a biological imperative for there to be, I mean, whether that decision is being made by some hormonal or, or communication mechanism that we don't understand a decision is being made there there mm-hmm. there is a decision in that space mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and probably like my guess is that the cells do understand at some basic level that death is just sort of part of it it's probably my, it's probably not running away from the stasi t cell because that wouldn't work on a uh, that that's a cancer cell, right? The one that runs away from the Stasi is 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 the is the one that becomes the cancer cell and takes over the whole body. It it it, it gets the message because what happens is when during um, apoptosis it gets a signal and then the cell self destructs. It's not an automatic thing. It's sort of this auto this autophagy. It's this this internal um, 
thing that happens. So probably the cell is like, well, my time's up. I've lived exactly one human cell life. And then boom, into the, into the greater superorganism where the, all the nutrients get reabsorbed and, uh, and, and moves forward. It's funny because in my anthropomorphizing of this, I often think of it more as a protecting mechanism that it's a that mm -hmm. it's more sacrificial that it's more protective than it is and and so maybe <laughs> maybe in my anthropomorphizing of this there's there's more righteousness of I'm doing this for the group and I I want mm -hmm. to take on this task right it's the it's the father going back into the burning house at the behest of the rest of his family. And so, I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways to apply our human lens to this and, and to kind of see sure. what that might represent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like the altruistic one. Let's go with that. It's, <laughs> it's more comforting, it's more comforting than the Stasi. but that, that also says like, how are you, how are, am I and you are mm -hmm. going to be the altruistic people? And it, it means showing up and being a good person. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and having some level of empathy for the people that we hate on Instagram. Yes. Um, or, you know, or, or the social media of your preference. Yes, absolutely. I, before we run out of time, I have this, this sort of burning question for you, because I think that one of the things that you do so beautifully in life, and I mean, throughout this conversation in your books, is you balance skepticism and curiosity and, and you mm -hmm. can correct me if I'm wrong and that doesn't feel true for you, but, but there is a, a dose of, of skepticism alongside a curiosity and a willingness to explore things that you might not agree with at first blush. And I think mm -hmm. within the context of this conversation, we could probably use a little bit more of that, right? A willingness to explore things that mm -hmm. we might feel a little bit mm -hmm. skeptical about. Yeah, I, I am a I'm a bundle of contradictions because I will get into things that I don't understand and then admit that I don't understand it and then try to figure it out. That's been the the method of my operating since you know since I was a kid, uh, and and I often have strong opinions, like I <laughs> and then I'll often change them. I'm like, look, I was just talking about Stasi cells. I'm like, ah, I like altruistic cells too. Like, I can I can. I can change my opinion and I don't feel bad about it. I do think the world in general is, uh, doesn't reward that behavior. I think the, the world right now rewards doubling down and tripling yeah, down on too. whatever belief I have because, because we don't, we, we don't, it doesn't work to admit that you're wrong, honestly. Like it, it works to like tell a lie and to just keep lying all the time. And if you see anyone who has ever like admitted like, oh, I was lying or I was wrong, then everyone's like, you were terrible. And they rip them apart and they, 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 they give them the symbol of apoptosis and they pop in front of you. And, um, uh, and that's a, a, that's a problem, right? That's a problem because it, it is so anti-humble. Uh, it is such a... A, an issue. And like, we do need leadership. Leadership is important, but we also need uh, rationality and you need to sort of balance those two things. Cause leadership does involve a love, level of ego. It's the idea that that person can lead. And on the other hand, you want that person who's leading to be like, let me look at all the data at the same time, because consciousness implies that you have to make good decisions, right? That's why consciousness, that's why your body is gave your, 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 that's why the, the superorganism you gave this unified sense of consciousness decision making is because it was going to look at all the data and not be insane about it. Uh, yeah. Where, where did, what was this question you asked? I think I'm way <laughs> off that, where uh, the question was. <laughs> I think you do such a good job of ba balancing skepticism and curiosity. And I think uh, we need more of that. And I think that. Yeah. And I, I, I think that a lot of that has to do with choice. And I think that the way that you view choice mm -hmm. through this lens of the wedge and the choice that we have when we're interacting mm -hmm. with our environments and, and how we respond to something like cold or heat or, yes. or stress, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're really good at making space for that choice. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that is the, um, yeah, I think it's important to be, to be both skeptical and take a chance, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's be like, what am I getting my cell phone to? I put my, my toe in the water and I try to like make reasonable decisions with the actions that I take. So for instance, when I met Wim Hof and I jumped into the cold water, he changed my mind, even though I thought he was going to be a cult leader. Yeah. Um, and, and it, it's sort of like, you know, 
I was willing to go along for the ride and be like, this is amazing. And it, it is life changing. And it's funny if I don't know if you're following my the, the craziness on my social media these days. But now I'm like, actually, Wim Hof, you're too famous now. And you're going crazy. You mm -hmm. are becoming the cult leader that I feared you would become. And, and, you know, and a lot of people don't like me because of this stuff, but I'm just trying to be honest and in the moment where I am, and I'm trying to look at the data because things change. People are not yes. eternal and, and, and rarely is everyone right all the time, but I can guarantee you the way that you're wrong more often is when you always stick to your guns and you cannot be proven wrong um, by yourself. And I think that one of the, the issues with the guru figure, you, know, you mentioned enlightenment before, but like, is when we all get put on our pedestals and this happens in, on, on a small level in social media anyway, like your followers who say, yeah, you're right. I agree with you. And the other person's like, I hate everything about you. As you get more and more famous, you get, you get enough of that positive pressure coming in there. Like, you're like, I am right. I am right about everything. You know, I'm talking to famous people. Mm -hmm. I make decisions and all of a sudden it becomes about you mm -hmm. and not the things you're doing anymore. And you know, in my book, The Enlightenment Trap, which is, a, you know, a pretty interesting book about yes. about the process of enlightenment. Enlightenment is this again, this atomization. If you think of enlightenment as a final state, and you are enlightened, and you see the ultimate nature of reality in a way that no one else ever could, that means you have no peers. And if you have no peers, you have no one giving you a check and a balance. And if you're a guy you just start having sex with all your students because it happens over and over again. Like it's, it's like, it's like this pattern. It's like they get up and they're like, Oh, well, the only thing that's right is my penis. And then your penis like rules the world. And like, mm -hmm. why is that? It's just so dumb. Cause then everyone was like, well, his penis is ruling the world. It's pretty messed up. And, and you see this process happen over and over again. It's, the, and on it's isolation media, again. Mm -hmm. It's isolation again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we just said it's a process, I, I can always learn from other people and I can be wrong. And, and sometimes you can be wrong and right at the same time. Like if you start going down that path, then you get, you lead to a path of, of, um, human experience, right? Like it, it, it's, you don't ever get to enlightenment. Enlightenment is a journey, but you get to the point of living your one human life to the fullest um, ability. And I, I know that with Wim Hof right now, what's going on with him and with his organization is you're starting to see really bad fallout from it. Like you're starting to see people die doing his method because he can't get out of his own ego on how to teach it mm -hmm. and say like, actually I can be wrong sometimes. So he doubles and triples down on things that are dangerous and you see people drowning. And, it, and it's a thing that could be so easily avoided if he could just look outside of himself for a minute. One of the things I like about you, and actually one of the ways that I've been looking at some interviews coming through this next fiscal quarter is evolution of thought process, because I think that's mm -hmm. so important because I think it's so easy to become stagnant. Like it is easy to be stagnant. Mm -hmm. It is hard to say, oh, I was wrong about this. And maybe I was a little bit right mm -hmm. about that. And there are bits and pieces along the way. And maybe tomorrow I'll think mm -hmm. something different. And I think that mm -hmm. we constantly have information coming in at a rate that I, I don't think is sustainable, but we, yeah. we, we have it all the same and it's coming in and how we are as an organism able to adapt to that information, mm -hmm. how our consciousness is able to mm -hmm. adapt and make turns and pivots with information is just like you said, part of the journey. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and everything, I mean, uh, the unfortunate thing is that the, the way we get more famous in the world, right? Is to do the same thing over and over again, right? And it's this is about the algorithms that are currently ruling us out of idiocy, right? Which is that is that you know if I put so I, I'm known for like ice baths, right? Yeah. If I just posted ice baths on my Instagram profile and was like, here are all the benefits of the ice bath, and I just said over and over again. Mm -hmm your mitochondria will be supercharged and you will live forever. And, 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 and I just keep on adding benefits to the ice bath. Even if I go off script, but I'm the ice bath guy, I will get very famous yeah. because the algorithm's like, well, people who like ice baths like this and then like this. And then, and, 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 and it's about what they, you know, I have some influencer friends who are very famous. They're like, you want depth in one thing and you don't want, you don't want breadth. You just want to do one thing hard forever. And that's what you get known for. And then you become famous. But that to me is, like fundamentally um, alienating. 
Is yes. That, I, I, and I don't want to be the ice bath guy. <laughs> and boring. I don't want to be Keith the Butcher, right? Like this is this has been uh-huh. my trajectory. I want that to be all I do. I have other interests than that. I don't want to just talk about meat. It's, right. it's boring. And you don't want to be th- you don't want to be thought about it. You don't want to experience it. You want to be like, yeah, I want to do 50 things. And I've written five books about everything from like organ trafficking, biohacking, cults. Cli- I have a book on climate change, that which is awesome, that no one reads. Um, but it was like probably my best book. And it's, 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 um, it's just one of those like tragedies of, of um, the way we absorb information mm-hmm. and the way algorithms push information is that, that, Everything in the world wants us to be narrow, but I want to go broad. And I think all of us want to go broad because specialization is boring. It's like not fulfilling. Like I want to do everything. Yeah. And yes. uh, What have you read that book? Uh, Being a generalist, I cannot think of the author's name. I'll put it in the show notes, but he talks about generalists. And Mm -hmm. how uh, most of humanity really identifies with being more of a generalist with, with a broader Mm -hmm. sense of interests and not this, Mm -hmm. this narrow, this narrow band. Yeah. I I mean, it's, it's, yeah, there's tons of, I mean, this is like the, it's, it's a fundamental consciousness thing too, right? Where there's focus, which is sympathetic. So sympathetic is your, sure. is your fight or flight response. Focus is, is sympathetic yeah. and parasympathetic is broad. Yeah. And, and we're always toggling between these two things and parasympathetic broadness is the flow state. Yeah. Where sympathetic is the grit state. And when we go broad, we, it's pleasurable. It is. Right? Being broad is fun. It's pleasurable. It's effortless. Whereas hyper focus is grueling and grinding and effective. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and there's room for both. Like I have depth in certain things, right? I, for instance, I speak a couple languages. I speak Hindi and I speak English and, um, and I speak a little bit of Spanish and it took effort to get to that, to, 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 to learn these two languages well, right? You know, English, I learned earlier, I learned Hindi later and it took a lot of effort. So I needed grit to get there. But then at some point you have to go broad with it. You're like, just let it go and let it, let it be. And I know I'll never learn Greek. I know I'll never <laughs> learn Latin. Um, I can't be a specialist in everything. And, uh, and yeah, this is, you know, some, Actually, I don't know any specialist doctors who like their job. I'll be honest. Like, I don't know any specialist scientists who are like, I'm so glad I just look at this one protein ligand yep. with my whole yep. life. I am this protein ligand dude. Yep. And and when you get super specialist knowledge, you also get, it gets siloed and they can't speak to other um, – you can't synthesize very easily between it. You need to come out and understand it. Uh, from a very broad perspective in order to put the parts together. And it becomes an act of reductionism. And when we're sitting here in this mm-hmm. podcast talking about how everything is interconnected and mm-hmm. you, we can't have a system independent or siloed from other systems. And I think mm-hmm. they, you know, they call a PhD piled higher and deeper for for a reason, <laughs> which, right. which is that you get this nice. sort of well of knowledge where you have a lot of depth, mm-hmm. but it's very small. And I, I wonder, just like you said, and I, I really liked this, that, you know, that sympathetic is that foveated focused and that parasympathetic mm-hmm. is that panoramic bigger mm-hmm. picture. And I think that I think, and I, I don't know, I think that our consciousness, and this is just something I've observed watching too many cows, right? Like when I watch a chat, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but when I watch a cow chew its cud, there is this space where it seems to melt into the environment and its consciousness seems to just expand outward into mm. the general vicinity. Um, it feels hmm. like an act of almost meditation to me, right? It's rumination, but not as we often mm-hmm call it as humans. Right. And I think that there is that broadness. And I think as humans, as we evolved, I think mostly we were just kind of spread out mm-hmm. like that. And it were mm-hmm. it was moments with that lion that suddenly everything came into a, a tighter mm-hmm. band of focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I mean, you're, you're, yeah, it's like the, the, the parasympathetic is the group. Right, it's mm, the environment, mm-hmm. and the, and sometimes you need to be the cell. Sometimes you need to be the yeah. the one thing addressing the problem. And it and the reason we can toggle 
through that is because it was evolutionary important and it was important for the group because the group needs to survive by the individuals and the individuals need to survive with the group. And it is a relationship between those two things. Uh, we just get so focused on our individualness that we 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 sort of forget about the society, even at the same time that we rely on it for like literally living. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know? yes. But when I when I go to King Supers, I'm really happy there's Brie there. I have no idea what Brie is. In <laughs> like no, but I love it. It's so good. But there's a there's a there's a person who's a, a Brie specialist who made that thing happen, and I'm psyched. Um, and the, and we so we're relying on both at yeah. the, at the same time. Yeah. I love that. And I think that's a good, I want to be conscious of your time. I think that's, that's a good place to start, sort of start to bring it around. And I want everybody, I know that we went way outside of the scope of, of some of your incredible books, but I want you to talk about, um, (laughs) you know, pointing people at the vortex since this is your least read Mm -hmm. and maybe most. Yeah. I mean, so all of my, I mean, I would say actually uh, because of where we've been talking about the vortex is about the deadliest storm in history and how that almost ended the world in nuclear war. So it's a little bit of a pivot from what we've been talking about. Um, but I, I would say that people should look at my most recent book, The Enlightenment Trap, yeah. uh, because it really is about this hyper focus on where um, on on the these practices that we think are very good meditation, mm-hmm. you know, Buddhism, like the, these, uh, you know, these these. The compassion for other people and how that can go terribly, terribly wrong. And it was, it, it's it, in many ways, it's the instigating. Um, I, I go over the instigating events of my life, the, the death of my student on a meditation retreat and the deaths of then other meditators who are all trying to be really, really good people. Like mm-hmm. I think that everyone's intentions are on the right course, but it goes so far off because they can't see the context in which they're operating. Yeah, And it's also the, I think my favorite part of having of of writing um, the Enlightenment Trap was to look at the very strange trip that Buddhism took to come to America and then go back to India and go to Tibet and then that then not just like how things go one direction but how there's a web of connections between things that have led to this very peculiar state of of Buddhism and like why are we on our yoga mat saying Namaste at the end of our uh, of, of our practice, you know, the divine light in me hails and, and honors the divine light in you. Well, that's not what namaste means. Namaste means chow. Um, but we have <laughs> like reinterpreted it over and over again to get to great get this special Sanskrit meaning so that it becomes sort of like a high Latin mass. Mm. Well, I don't understand that word. Therefore, it must be interesting. interesting. And then we invoke these powers to it. And it's a I know it's a wild book and I just put out a new audio book. It's, it's it. really um, good too. And- I, I love your audio books. I, I love listening nice. to you read your audio books. I have listened to, mm. I listened to what doesn't kill us and I listened to the enlightenment trap and I read the wedge, but I, I really enjoy cool. the way, what you bring to your own books in audio format. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for having listened to it because I really put a lot of I learn, it's funny when you write a book, you write it at a certain t- point of the time and then you, then you forget about it for a while and then you read it in the audiobook. And I always find that I learn new things. And sometimes I'm like, wow, that was really smart. And sometimes I'm like, oh, shit, Scott, why did you write that better? But um, uh, you constantly but make it's, new it's connections. A, I mean, that's the, right? Yeah. That's the evolution. You read it back to your, oh, mm-hmm. well, okay, I love that. And, <laughs> totally. I was like, Scott, you and your passive voice, have you, can you not fix that? Like, um, and I do fix it in the audiobooks because when I'm reading something, I don't like it. I actually rewrite it as I'm talking, but sometimes mm. it doesn't get in the context. So the audiobooks are always the most up to date of anything that I do. Well, I love that. And I love listening to you. And I've listened to you on, on many a very hot summer day fixing fences and, and nice. many a very cold winter day also fixing fences. It's all we do. We just fix fences. But um, Well, you know, you got to create that cell wall, right? <laughs> I need boundaries, more boundaries. I'm just trying mm-hmm. to go for that isolation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was well, awesome. Go ahead. It, it was such a pleasure. Oh, no, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this is really a blast. And I hope that, uh, you know, if you should you ever come back to Denver, I think you have a shop here. Um, <laughs> we uh, should we should hang out and we'll do some ice baths and saunas. And I would and love that. It'll be it'll be a blast. I would love yeah, that. And absolutely. I think maybe we should talk about getting you somewhere to participate in a slaughter and to to experience that firsthand. 
can I ask the chickens for their papers? I don't think so. I don't think they understand <laughs> your English, much like your cats. Chickens are also <laughs> not great at understanding English. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to get what's coming to them. Um, <laughs> great. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh,